Welcome to another episode of Good Value by Antipodes. There appears to be a shift underway in global markets. Expectations around rate cuts have been meaningfully adjusted, which catalyzed a repricing of bonds. And while we're still at multi-decade high levels of market concentration, we have started to see a broadening in performance. Parts of the mega cap tech complex are still performing, but we have seen a rotation into real assets like gold and copper. So as the market starts to tilt towards the higher for longer interest rate scenario, something that we at Antipodes have been projecting for some time, what does this mean for portfolio construction? Is it time to retreat from tech stocks and rethink commodities? Joining me today to share Antipodes' views and positioning in these two critical parts of the market is portfolio manager Graham Hay. Graham, it's always a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thanks, Alison. Great to be on the podcast. At the beginning of the year, the market was very much in the soft landing cap, you know, with expectations around inflation falling, then allowing the Fed to undertake dovish rate cuts. But that's starting to change. The US economy has been incredibly resilient. It's been pretty insensitive to the aggressive rate hiking cycle. The consumer has been propelled by excess savings. And we're also on the cusp of an AI and climate-driven investment boom. So to start with... Can the US economy keep powering ahead? Well, that's um, that's a great topic to start on. Uh, you're right. The US has proved to be much more resilient in the face of what what has been one of the steepest hiking hiking cycles of the last uh, fifty years. Um, um, and you know, with that, we've had the impact of inflation, uh, which has remained stubbornly high, um, as you mentioned. Uh, yet, despite that, um, US growth. Um, uh, from the beginning of this year has actually started to reaccelerate, uh, which sort of confounds a lot of the <laughs> the prior analysis, um, and that's made the Fed's job much more difficult. Um, uh, so, you know, there are obviously a number of factors driving that. Um, there is uh, there are numerous stimulus programs that are feeding through um, into a you know what is a fundamentally tight market for uh, various parts of the economy. Um, yeah, you know, we've had uh, the announcement of the Chips Act. We've had the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we've had the uh, the spillover impact of the uh, the COVID stimulus spending for the consumer, uh, which you know be reminded that that is seventy percent of GDP. Um, and so there's a, a number of these forces have have allowed the U.S. economy to continue to be uh, very resilient. Um, we are seeing signs, uh, however, that some of the impact of that uh, higher for longer inflation, uh, just the um, sustained impact of higher cost of living, is starting to uh, starting to drag on the consumer. And there's data there's there's data out there that shows that the the bulk of the s- surplus savings is now being drawn down. So it's not surprising that we're starting to see some of the figures uh, demonstrate uh, more weakness, and and that has maybe given the Fed some room to think about easing this year, but they've been very adamant that uh, they'll be they'll be data dependent. Um, and if the data allows, um, they will move on rates, but they're very they're also very firm about their two percent inflation commitment. Have been reiterating that in the press uh, just this week. So um, inflation needs to uh, keep edging down uh, before the Fed are able to act. Um, and at the same time you've got these very strong uh, fiscal programs that are, you know, sort of acting against that ambition, <laughs> and uh, uh, that's making the job of the Fed uh, all the more challenging. Um, so, uh, look, we, we, where, where's, where does that leave us? Us, I, I should say, where, where you know, inflation uh, is clearly higher than the Fed would like. Um, the higher rate regime, we think, has eventually an eroding effect on the consumer. And then various parts of the um, corporate landscape, which are susceptible to higher rates, you know, um, speaking of areas such as commercial property, for instance, uh, private equity, uh, private loans are are all parts of the system that are vulnerable to this rate regime that we're in today. Um, So it remains a pretty complex environment, um, but, um, you know, there are still opportunities out there, both within the US and, you know, we think increasingly um, in, in, in other parts of the world. And as I alluded to in the opening, we've seen some meaningful moves in both tech and commodities this year. So let's talk tech first, and then we'll go to commodities. 
So in the tech space, we have seen a divergence in the performance of mega cap tech. You know, Tesla and Apple are both down this year, and that's against an S&P that's up almost 10%. But NVIDIA has continued to defy gravity. And, and you know, it's had a phenomenal run because of its near monopoly over AI chips and its pricing power, building and operating AI models as both power and hardware intensive. So a huge demand for NVIDIA's GPUs. And the market has blessed NVIDIA with the title of ultimate AI winner. But we know that with any nonlinear change, the landscape will shift over time. Now, Graham, you have a, a long history covering technology stocks over the course of your career. So what is your take? Uh, yeah, look, the, uh, the, the the arrival of the commercial implementation, I guess you'd say, of these large language models, which have been fermenting for a number of years prior to this, but really the release of uh, ChatGPT in November 2022 and then the subsequent cycle of investment that has uh, uh, gone on um, to follow that has been you know, pretty unprecedented. Really, you have to go back to the late 90s um, to have witnessed something that's remotely close to what we're seeing. Um, and you, know, you mentioned NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been the prime beneficiary of that spending cycle. And, and the stock has done exceptionally well over the last year. Um, but it's worth noting that in, NVIDIA's share price performance has been you know, completely underwritten by both revenue and profit growth over that period. So that whilst the stock has had a very good run, the, the, the notional valuation today on, on current earnings is actually not as extreme as you might think. Um, mm. Now, the question is, you know, how sustainable is this level of spending if we are, mm. in fact, in an arms race to build uh, more capacity, train ever more sophisticated models? I think, I think that the, there are still some questions to be answered about the sustainability of, sp- of spending, given that we really yet to uh, properly put uh, any sort of commercial um, commercial uh, revenues around uh, the, these these models that are being trained, um, but but really the, the way we're thinking about it is that um, the capability of these large language models is transformational, and it will no doubt find its way into the way companies operate and the way and the way consumers interact with with um, the digital and and physical world. Um, and one of the areas we're contemplating is how uh, these models will uh, move their way from these large data centers, <clears throat> which has just been where the majority of the spending has been happening, um, out out into the out into the real world or the or the edge as we call them um, to to the device level. Um, so you know we're starting to think about uh, other ways that we can get exposure to this transformation uh, and. Um, you know, uh, there are some interesting stocks out there that have very strong positions today that we don't think are priced for, you know, uh, either a, grow, a replacement cycle of demand or growth in content that could come with some of these new AI use cases. Mm. And do you think, you know, I'd, I, I want to get to talk about some of these ideas that, that, you know, you're clearly working on. But before we get to that, do you think, you know, competition could be building um against NVIDIA in terms of the lock that it currently has over these chips. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, that, that's the other dynamic here that, uh, that is very unique to this environment. Um, you know, if you go back over the last you know, 25 years, we had a uh, an era of, of complete specialization whereby all of the big systems companies of the first era of technology, the mainframe companies and systems companies, gradually gave way to specialized providers of both software and hardware. So we had a disaggregation of the technology uh, stack as we knew it in the sort of 70s and 80s, and that gave way to specialty companies. Um, uh, today, uh, you know, we, we're seeing the opposite happen, happening. And, and probably the best example of that has been Apple over the last decade, who have insourced more and more of their requirements of their, of their, of their devices. They displaced Intel chips with their own um, internally designed chips for their for their Mac line, um, uh, and and we're also seeing the cloud companies who have you know unprecedented levels of scale uh, also begin to internalize um, a lot of the key technology that that they use to run their applications and workloads on. Amazon were really the first to to start doing that uh, on the networking side, 
uh, but we've seen a much more aggressive push into silicon by the cloud companies over the last two or three years. Uh, one of the data points that we track are, um, are job openings um, across the cloud companies, and it's been very evident that the demand for silicon engineers has been growing very rapidly for the last five years amongst the, the hyperscale cloud companies. So it's no surprise that we're hearing more and more about um, alternatives to merchant silicon, such as that provided by NVIDIA. Uh, ultimately, these cloud companies will want to optimize uh, the um, the cost of running these workloads, and that may involve displacing you know third party products where they can. So uh, I think that's something we'll continue to 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 evolve. Uh, right now, NVIDIA have a, a strong lead um, and. Um, they have a lot of momentum behind them, but um, clearly the landscape could could and is likely to shift over the next one to two years. Mm-hmm. There's there's no doubt that AI and the cloud are tomorrow's megatrends. So where are you finding opportunities to take exposure to this investment cycle where valuations make sense? That's, that's a good question. It's the one we ask ourselves all the time, of course, <laughs> as an investor. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, I think when we last spoke, Alison, on the podcast, I, I talked about TSMC. Um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here starts with TSMC. They are, you know, they are the largest and most sophisticated foundry company in the in the world. Um, um, all of the all of the chips that you um, use inside your your device, a lot of the chips you use inside your computers these days are manufactured at TSMC. And the company have proven over, you know, several decades now that they have a very strong position in that industry. Uh, and I think the recent data point around Intel's attempts to build a foundry from scratch and how difficult that's proving to be, just a further evidence of the strength of TSMC's position, particularly at the leading edge of manufacturing. So look, at 18 times earnings um, with the demand cycle ahead of them that we see, I think that's still a very reasonable proposition as a stock and something we own in our in our funds. Um, but but looking beyond that, those sort of, let's say, first order beneficiaries of, of AI, we're now starting to think about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, edge applications. So how will AI proliferate at the edge, right? When will it become consumerized? Um, and there's, there's several drivers of that. The cost of running AI workloads in the in the cloud in uh, centralized data centers, um, we we know we know from the capital spending that's coming through uh, at the cloud companies, we know that that's expensive. There's ultimately a desire to offload some of those compute requirements to edge devices. Um, you know, for example, Microsoft's Copilot is something that could that could benefit enormously from. Uh, more localized compute in the in the PC or laptop on which you're using that service. Um, so you know we're thinking about who and uh, and how companies might may benefit from that. Um, you know, recently we've gone back to a, a, a prior holding of the firms, a company called Qualcomm. Um, Qualcomm, as some of you may know, is the leader in uh, providing. Uh, both the in- intellectual property as well as the chips that use that are used to power most um, most handsets, including including Apple, um, and we see uh, a roadmap that Qualcomm have to um, to add more compute capabilities into a next generation device um, that will enable the use of uh, large language models on the device itself, and so that could both grow the content available for Qualcomm, but it could also catalyze an upgrade cycle. In the handset industry, which is um, these days is, is sort of very mature. So there's a couple of opportunities for Qualcomm. We think for a stock that again is pretty modestly priced relative to the market and relative to its own, you know, sort of uh, status in the industry. Um, so uh, that, that that's a couple of ideas that we think are still uh, worth pursuing. So so TSMC and Qualcomm and, you know, along with Oracle, another portfolio holding that we featured on this podcast before, are good examples of pragmatic value exposure to AI and the cloud. Now, now let's turn to commodities. The sector has been getting a lot of attention recently and, and not all commodities have had a strong quarter. Oil has been notably flat 
despite tensions in the Middle East. And the real action has been in gold, which is up around 10% this year, and, and metals like copper, nickel, aluminium and zinc, which are all up around 15%. So what's driving these price moves and are they sustainable? Yeah, that's a good question and sort of um, in some ways it's a, a little bit tied to the, the previous discussion in in relation to technology, a lot of the pull through of commodities uh, is is increasingly being catalyzed by investments in in data centers and energy transition more generally. Um, but but what I think we're really seeing is the the beginning of the other side of the COVID cycle. Um, you know, COVID created a, a number of distortions across the global system um, and left us with a bit of a hangover um, as consumers destocked um, after um, a reopening occurred across the globe. Uh, that destocking process <clears throat> led to um, a number of commodities going through a difficult time over the last 18 months. Um, and coupled, coupled with that, you had you know inflation eating into, the, um, eating into the, the profit and loss statements of a lot of the commodity companies. Uh, so that, that, that created a pretty pretty challenging backdrop, not to mention, you know, the weakness in the Chinese economy, which is uh, the world's largest consumer of these commodities. Um, we now seem to be emerging from the other side of that, whereby some of the structural drivers, the demand drivers, that is, are now starting to reassert themselves. Um, and uh, and that has been married with uh, what remains uh, a, a period of underinvestment um, across these key commodities. And that's really the basis for our sort of positive or constructive view. Um, now, I think you, you still need to be selective, but when we look at the um, performance of copper, for example, uh, this year, um, particularly since February, uh, the commodity has rallied quite a lot, up about 15% from its lows. Uh, you know, it's very clear to us that the, um, the level of investment required to meet the demand that is projected by 2030 is still... Well below what what has has been you know what is, uh, has been scheduled by uh, by the miners. Um, so we we see the potential for a continued very tight market um, in in commodities like copper, um, and it's really you know driven by that combination of structural demand drivers uh, and underinvestment in uh, in in the assets themselves. Um, so that 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 remains pretty interesting to us. We have some direct exposure there that we've had for a few years now. Um, gold is a somewhat unique story. Um, you know, gold. Uh, we we talk about it in U.S. dollars, but gold in other currencies has been hitting new highs for a number of years now. It finally broke through to U.S. Uh, new highs in U.S. dollars earlier this year. And what's interesting is, is it, it, as you said, it's it's come at a time. Uh, when we've had real rates increasing, and normally they those two things are inversely correlated. Uh, in other words, gold prices would suffer in a rising real rate environment. Uh, but you know what we're observing is the combination of um, you know, particular uh, central bank buying. Uh, we are seeing uh, retail interest, particularly out of China, in gold, and then more recently we've seen ETF interest in the in 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 the commodity. Um, that have drive that are driving uh, uh, prices to the highs that we've seen. <clears throat> um, so we we think fundamentals for gold are still very well supported. Um, the interesting uh, question though is how to play that. And the miners have dramatically underperformed the gold price over the last five years. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. But um, at the end of the day, the mining industry, the gold mining industry, has to do a better job of generating sustainable levels of cash flow generating positive returns on invested capital um, and understanding that there's more to being a gold company than just watching the gold price move higher. Um, so uh, we, we, we have, um, you know, we have existing positions there where we think that is happening. Um, Agnico Gold would be a great example. Uh, and then a larger position in Barrick, which we think has just a, an under, underappreciated position a reserve position in both in gold and copper, um, and was you know we think we'll see signs through the balance of twenty four uh, that the company are actually starting to grow production, and with that unit costs will come down and cash flows will come through. Graham, we've owned tech resources in Canada for a number of years now. 
What, what's the update on the outlook for that company? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of activity in at tech over the last 12 months. Um, you know, our original thesis for uh, taking the position in early 2021 was that it was tech was, was at the time one of the, the last remaining holdouts uh, of, of restructuring, you know, following the sort of commodities bust um, in 2000 and sort of 13, 14, 15. Um, we saw an opportunity in a company that had high quality assets, uh, but had a poor record of capital allocation and a management team, which was not particularly favored by the market. And, um, and um, uh, that was sort of uh, that, that combination in our minds represented multiple ways of winning. Um, you know, fast forward to 2024 and a, a lot of those things have actually played out. Um, we've had uh, changes in management uh, we've had um, governance reform. Uh, the family uh, have a uh, a super a super voting share, which they've announced that they will um, forego um, um, in the coming years. And um, th- the biggest uh, of all was the announced sale of the coal business to Glencore, <clears throat> uh, which will close in the third quarter of this year. And that will leave Tech Resources as a primarily copper and base metals pure play uh, listed in listed in Canada, of course, but with assets across the globe. Uh, and you know, when we look at the profile of the company um, and the profile of the commodities uh, that they're exposed to over the next five years, it looks like a pretty interesting story still. Um, so we're we're we've been taking advantage of, of weakness in the stock um, over the last twelve months um, as we've gone through the transaction announcement. Um, there's been a lot of turnover of the shareholder base, uh, but we think you know going into second half of this year with the sale of the coal business, the redeployment of those proceeds, um, some of which will come back to shareholders, and then just the outlook for the commodity itself. I think tech is still a pretty interesting way to get exposure to that. So Graham, pulling all of this together, in- investors need to look for opportunities beyond mega caps where some of the earnings streams aren't attractively priced. And, you know, you've highlighted we're finding AI beneficiaries on mid to high teens multiples. And in commodities, it's about cutting through the noise and speculation and taking exposure to areas where supply and demand dynamics look attractive. But what are your key takeaways for each sector? I think if you look at what's happening through the lens of an arms race, um, uh, there are parallels to to 2000, you know, we had a, a fiber optic communications boom in in the late 90s. Um, a lot of that capacity um, uh, was uh, was overbuilt. Um, it, it was it was game changing technology in that it enabled all of the things we take for granted today um, and the way we use the internet. But um, there was a, a period thereafter where um, you know uh, when investment receded um, and, and valuations came down. But there were second order beneficiaries of all of that investment. And so I think the time is now to start thinking about those second order beneficiaries and how AI as a technology will permeate its way through into our, our daily lives. Um, and, and, and no doubt there'll be more ideas to come um, over the coming couple of years. But that's, that's the way we're thinking about uh, the current technology landscape. On the commodity side, I think it's, you know, for us, it's, it's really joining the dots on the bigger cycle. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in areas where we've had you know, uh, uh, fundamental um, levels of underinvestment against a, a fixed or improving demand backdrop, then I think those areas are, are pretty interesting. Now, that's precisely what catalyzed the oil cycle in 2021. Mm. Uh, we went through a period of, of heavy underinvestment and consolidation um, oil prices temporarily went negative in 2020, if you remember. Um, and then yeah. uh, a few short years later, we ended up in a very strong price cycle and the, the equities responded. Mm. So I, I think you know, looking at the various parts of the commodity landscape through that lens is an interesting starting point. Um, I mentioned copper, but you know there are other interesting parts of the industry uh, where, where you know, we're favorably disposed to agricultural commodities here. Um, and also looking at other interesting areas like aluminium. 
which is probably the unheralded beneficiary of a lot of a lot of, a lot of the energy transition that's that's happening. So, um, uh, both areas are, are ripe for opportunities, and um, you know we've got certainly got our ideas lined up. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, you've given us some great new ideas to think about in the tech space and some food for thought in commodities. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Alice. The content in this podcast is general information only. It is not advice of any kind and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation, objectives or needs. You should seek professional advice before making any financial decisions. Stock commentary is illustrative only and not a recommendation to buy, hold or sell any security.